I want to start off where Nate Hagens and others at ASPO would have started off. I think it has to be increasingly the starting point for any debate on energy. And that's how we think um, individually and collectively and what the neuroscientists are finding out about that. Then I want to talk about um, systemic risks in energy markets because I think the future electricity system will be crafted as much by shock as it will by policy. Um, and then I'll give an analysis of the players and the systemic risks that we're all taking and then in the last quarter or so of the talk get on to the actual um, likely, or as I think it will be, um, likely future electricity system. Let's start with the neuroscience. Now, um, every so often scientific disciplines um, go through explosions of understanding. When Ron uh, Oxborough was my prophet at, in Oxford, it, it was plate tectonics. But the neuroscientists now have tools that they didn't have 10 years ago. Uh, magnetic resonance energy, imaging huge um, experimental databases and abilities to process data and they're finding all sorts of fascinating things which I'm going to give an amateur's summary of uh, but I think that it's terribly relevant to energy um, policy. They talk about us humans being predictably irrational um, and that's a title of one of the most famous textbooks, predictably irrational, interesting. Um, and if you dig into why we're predictably irrational and how they can predict our irrationality, there are a number of themes. We're prone to the endowment effect. If we, if we have something um, and we're offered a, a different entity that might rationally be preferable, we, we, we tend to stick with the endowment. We like the endowment. We have an optimism bias that allows us to do this. So in our thinking, you know, we really much prefer comforting narratives to... Um, uncomfortable narratives and that plays out an awful a lot in the risk dramas we see daily in our newspapers. Once we get belief systems and you think about how passionate, tribal almost, the um, energy debate is with the different camps arguing with each other. Once we're in a belief system and this applies just as much to those of us in clean energy as it does to the incumbency, you know, we, we, we defend it and the neuroscientists I'm not surprised by this uh, because they have discovered that with very many human minds, if you present rational evidence, and here the climate change debate and the Republicans come to mind, you can actually drive people deeper into their belief system. So all this is rather bad news uh, for those of us who would prefer to win, you know, have a chance of winning arguments with rational thought. Um, but there's also good news. We're um, much more pro-social, that's the word the practitioners use, and empathic uh, than perhaps historically people would have had us believe, and there's a lot to play with there. But an issue in the energy debate is this individual and collective tendency to prefer belief in comforting narratives, and that plays out in the risk debate. Now, many of us, perhaps most in this room, um, would take the view that with climate change, for example, but perhaps also other elements of resource depletion, you know, we, if we keep going the way we are, we are going to bring down civilization. None of this is going to surprise the anthropologists who, of course, have um, right through human history seen lost civilizations and analyzed how they went down, the Maya, um, the Easter Islanders and others. There's a vast literature on this. So this ultimately is the stakes. I don't want to be melodramatic, but I think this is what we're talking about when we talk about resource depletion. I mean, the Easter Islanders persuaded themselves to chop down the last tree. How did they do that when they had no way of going anywhere else? So um, we need to bear all this in mind as we look at the risks that we're running in and around energy markets today. So I'm going to consider them more than five, but these are the five that I have... Um, most experience of day in, day out. I saw the financial crisis um, roll over us from within the boardroom of a Swiss bank's private equity fund. Uh, and of course, the other issues were climate change I've been working on uh, uh, de deliberately for 25 years. And these are the three issues that I'll go through now one at a time. Let me first pose the, um, the, the dilemmas and uh, in all five cases, you can, you can see that there are polarized views. This is the tendency in these, uh, in these risk debates. 
financial system risk, you know, but periodically the financial incumbency tries to persuade us that it's all okay, you know, we've had a blip, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry about the financial crisis, but it's all okay now. This was Bob Diamond's famous effort before the LIBOR scam um, unrolled, you know, it's time for a morse is over. But, you know, many people don't believe it, and uh, this includes in the establishment, the Financial Times famous series, Capitalism in Crisis, where their own commentariat uh, was saying, you know, we have not solved this problem, it's waiting to happen again. Uh, and, of course, the state of the streets shows that many people in many countries just don't believe that the system is fixed. The climate system uh, risk I've referred to, it, it, it's sometimes stupendously tribal and never more so than, than in America. Um, the famous Bloomberg cover about Hurricane Sandy and you know, one of the many um, films that expose the climate scientists as uh, a great international conspiracy to increase their research funding. And what's at issue here are policy constraints as the incomers. They, they, they talk, they use that word, um, constraint. They don't talk about necessity or opportunity uh, it's policy constraint, and it's about their social license, the license we give them to continue the way they are. I'm going to talk a little bit about the carbon bubble risk. So there are two views here. Um, Nick Stern at the release of the Carbon Tracker's second report. I have the great privilege of um, chairing this financial think tank, Carbon Tracker, you know, basically saying you can't believe two things at once. You can't believe that we have a system that in any way is going to get close to two degrees and that the fossil fuel companies, the energy companies, are anywhere near valued. They have, a, they have an assets at risk issue that is completely unrecognized by the financial system. Um, and that essentially is what he's saying. The reactions, when our report came out, the FT interviewed a whole swath of analysts and fund managers, and this is what one of them said, I think it's a bollocks subject. I'm not interested in this kind of subject. I think it's complete hot air. Now, that's how I imagine that fund manager. I don't know that's, uh, that's how he looks, but I'm sure it's the first time the, um, the, 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 the FT has actually used the word. Um, I'm not going to repeat it. It's too rude. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you see, how much rationality is there going on here? This is a disturbed person talking about an assault on their belief system. It's not a, he's not saying the markets have priced in the risk of, of carbon assets being stranded. He's saying this is a bollock subject. Great. What university was he educated at? Hopefully not this one. Um, oil depletion risk, utterly tribal. Um, two ridiculous front covers, drowning in oil, the, the famous economist cover, a world without oil, neither remotely what we're talking about. Yesterday we did see the two tribal end members very um, calmly outlined by Roger Bentley and um, our friend from Sierra. And then the shale surprise risk, again, there are two views. You, you'd barely know this if you only had a cursory view of the newspapers. You would think that shale um, is a new route to healthy economies. It's a game changer that's eminently exportable from the US. You know, day after day, we see this messaging coming across. But there is a debate. There's, uh, there, there is a kickback against this, which we best see in the pages of the oil drum, but very rarely gets into the mainstream press. This is a debt-laden route to the self-destruction of an industry, as Art Berman described it at, a, at our Vienna meeting. Um, and even if it isn't that, it's uh, an exceptionally um, American phenomenon that isn't going to be exportable the way so many people are, are reckoning. Um, so the uh, issue here is, is this yet another of these bubbles that we're capable of, of, of blowing up? Uh, and also the social license, again, for the oil and gas industry. So let's look at the players. And I think, you know, um, very little in this life is black and white, but you can clearly see that there is an incumbency at work here, and it consists of three elements. It's big energy, thankfully not all of it. There are dissidents within big energy. Uh, there's big capital, and again, thankfully, not all of it. Like any civil war, you know, there are people who support different sides under the same roof, um, time and time again, in fact. And there's institutional support, but not all of it. But, and that institutional support, for those of us who bump up against it, is just breathtaking. I mean, it's so solid. Uh, if I could just think of one example, the leaked uh, emails that showed on day three of the Fukushima um, incident, 
what were deck officials thinking about? Um, were they going through, you know, following a risk? No, they wanted to bring in Siemens, they wanted to bring in Arriva and EDF and think how they were going to explain to the British population that there wasn't a problem. Day three, they can have had no idea how that drama was going to play out. So this is how the incumbency works. It's very culturally coherent. I see this time and time again. Um, BP's, you know, use of the statistical review of of world energy. We don't believe in peak oil uh, at BP. That's Christoph Ruhl, chief economist speaking. You will have heard him say this. We don't believe, belief is a big word, it's a recurrent word in all this, in peak oil. Not, we don't believe there's a risk from premature peak oil. We don't believe in peak oil, full stop. Okay, he's an economist. He doesn't understand that oil's finite, perhaps. But, um, you know, it's very coherent, and that's why there are so few whistleblowers. Uh, it's the people who leave the oil industry who begin to speak out, as the membership of ASPO shows. <laughs> so, apart from Total, uh, let's pay due homage to Total. They're very good at, set, at, at telling stories. Um, I was on a panel with Tony Haywood the other week at the FT Global Energy Leaders Summit uh, with Exxon and Arch Cole and Tony and me and my blood pressure probably breaking all kinds of world records. Tony said, gas and oil are infinite. Those were his exact words. Now, this is a guy who has a PhD in geoscience, like me, actually, at this university in Edinburgh. Uh, he felt comfortable in front of the world saying gas and oil are infinite. Actual words, you can see it on the, on the FT's website. There's a film. And, you know, if you can say that, then it's very easy to say that shale is a game changer and not talk about risk in any context there. So the incumbency has uh, lots of paid secondes in Whitehall from the big companies. At one time recently, there were 50 in various Whitehall ministries. Now, this is people are on the payroll of the big energy companies who are in Whitehall working as officials, okay, on secondment. The renewable energy industries have precisely zero. So is it a wonder then that we have an electricity market reform agenda that is so skewed towards nuclear? Is it a wonder that the Treasury can write to DEC and as we saw in the leaked letter from George Osborne, you know, basically say we've got to cut a deal and you have to suppress renewables, I'm paraphrasing but fairly, in order that we don't put off gas investors as we try and turn the UK into a gas hub of course, his father-in-law is a gas lobbyist as well. So this is what we're, we have to deal with in the energy policy debate. And there's also a strong default um, favoring of the incumbency. You know, the FT Global Energy Leaders Summit, that panel I was on was called, Are We Entering a New Era of Fossil Fuels? We were half an hour into that panel before anyone had even mentioned climate change. And I said to one of the journalists at the FT, you couldn't have called it that in Silicon Valley. You'd have had to call it, is clean tech going to disrupt, or is, that, is there a chance clean tech is going to disrupt the uh, incumbency? And I put it to you, and I said this with a smile, I put it to you um, that your business model doesn't allow you to do that. You know, no one would have turned up. Uh, and she looked at me wryly and said, you could well be right, Jeremy. So there's a default problem, you see, that we, we have to deal with. It's easy to marginalize opponents. And it's worse than this. Uh, many of us in this room will have had this experience. An example I'm thinking of is a guilt-stricken senior, very senior executive from one of the big PR houses who took me out for lunch and said, um, never use my name or say that I told you this, uh, but um, they're using black arts to try and kill you. Now, he wasn't, thankfully, he wasn't referring to me personally, he was referring to the renewables industries. And his agency you know, has a brief uh, to, for below the line uh, use of media to, um, to do renewables down. And this is why you see front page Daily Mail headlines of that kind, too windy for wind turbines. You know, one turbine has, has a gearbox problem. Shock, horror. I mean, think of the casualties that are going to build up as a result of that. And the abiding lie, and it is a lie, that um, you know, your, your energy bills are going up because of the, um, the price of subsidies for renewables. Everyone knows it's primarily the wholesale price of gas. So this is what we have to deal with. And they storyboard it all out. They maximize, you know, when these things come out in the media, they're designed to hurt renewables um, the most. And it's a big problem. So the insurgency, that's a big word. 
Um, some dictionary def definitions talk about bearing arms for insurgency, but others say you don't have to be armed to be an insurgent. Um, and they use that language. There's a famous meeting in Houston where you know, the speakers talked about the insert. They use the language of terrorism. They're incapable of distinguishing in their use of language between the Taliban and the renewables industry. <laughs> So um, are we in the surge? I, I prefer to be thought of as the transition, you know, or perhaps the disruption. But okay, if they want to think of us as insurgents, I'm happy to be an insurgent. I'm never going to bear arms for renewable energy, but, you know, I'm going to fight hard uh, within the law using civic means. And who are we? We're big energy breakout thinkers, thankfully. There are, you know, we saw one of them yesterday. Um, there are small en energy, many companies like my own, big capital breakout thinkers. Um, emerging institutional support, and I think crucially, uh, the, the emerging people power constituencies that we see just the early stages of out of the back of the financial crisis, the crowdfunding movement, um, and all the rest of that, and retail bonds by, um, offered by progressive institutions. So how the insurgency works, I think this, I should have called this slide, how the insurgency barely works. Uh, we're culturally incoherent. We often war against each other unnecessarily, wind versus solar. That makes it very difficult for ministers and officials who might want to seek transition. We're useless at telling stories. How many people understand what's behind the solar trade war? What's behind it is the systematic lobbying of the incumbency in multiple markets to actually do down feed-in tariff regimes that were until 2007 driving real value into, um, into renewables. So um, we don't have much influence, we don't have paid secondes in Whitehall, and we're, uh, we're inadequately um, synergizing with natural allies. So the clean tech revolution has not played out like the digital revolution or the internet revolution um, for investors. And here's a typical um, article from the Financial Times making that point, where my own company has sort of been used as a um, a poster child. These are solar century roof tiles. So um, the pattern of play in systemic risk taking, let's quickly go through um, each of the five and take a view as to what's happening. The financial crash has not gone away. Uh, we've seen all the CEOs of the investment banks who before the crisis um, chastised whistleblowers for, or people sounding warnings for not understanding complex derivatives. So they all lined up in Congress, raising their hands to say, sorry, I didn't really understand what a complex derivative was either. I was only, I am only the CEO. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the Occupy uh, movement that sprang up and all the demonstrations that took place around the world, a lot of public pressure, the very inventive um, use of invasions of banks, civil disobedience in the UK. This is a group of young mums who've turned a branch of Barclays into something socially useful. And if I can make that out, I think it's a laundry. Um, and you know, if you look at the way things were in the summer of 2008 and what we were being told by the incumbency then, I see many parallels with what we get told by the energy incumbency. There's a sort of craziness looking back to what <coughs> They were saying, Chuck Prince, um, CEO of City, you know, when the music stops uh, in terms of liquidity, it'll get complicated. But as long as the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. We're still dancing. What a great business model that is. Uh, and yet, five years on, um, we get told on a recurrent basis by the likes of the IMF and the Bank of England that nothing has changed. Collectively, essentially, we have really not stopped this mad machine. It's still there, um, just waiting to crash on us, as John Kay pointed out in the FT just the other day. So, okay, we've lost opportunities in the financial crash, um, but, you know, there's a, there's a learning experience in society, and is this likely to happen again with the next crash? Climate crisis risk, I don't want to say much about this. We heard a lot yesterday. We're avowedly on the, world, the road to six degrees. We're seeing the first faint footprint of what this will do to the world. And I think, um, you know, all of us have experience of this. In my own case, just in recent weeks, I heard a very senior official at an investment bank seminar in the city 
uh, from the International Finance Corporation, just say casually, we're currently, unless we radically change the energy system, we're currently on a course that risks destroying global food and water supply. So, you know, in the early years, it was the environment groups that tend to use emotive language like this. Now you can find such views right in the heart of the establishment. And it is incredible, is it not, that people can believe that you can just go on pumping billions of tons of gases that we know to be radiatively active into that thin thing, which is the Earth's atmosphere seen from space. So how do we turn off those taps? And many of us increasingly believe that the policymakers aren't going to do it. So uh, can we turn off the capital taps? And this is the carbon bubble risk. And here you see the budget in crimson for staying below two degrees, a mere 225 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, that smallest circle. And then in the purple, at 762, that's the budget for the listed companies, and that's the current reserves that listed companies have, not national companies, listed companies. Way too much for their pro rata share of what can be burned. And if the existing capex actually goes right the way through the system and brings in the resources that they're trying to turn into reserves currently, we go right out to 1,500 um, billion tons. So there is a, um, as the financiers would call it, there is a risk of impairment of these assets. This is the language you have to use, not the, the language of emotion or morality. You know, you have assets at risk and it's not being recognized. This, um, ladies and gentlemen, is, is proving to be a very potent way of dealing with the problem. There's real traction now in this argument that Carbon Tracker have been putting out for the last two years. Here, because what um, we've done is go stock exchange by stock exchange and company by company, the top 200 fossil fuel companies. So now this risk is being discussed in a way that sort of forces the financial chain to deal with it. And if you look at how overweight these stock exchanges are, London, New York, and Moscow, um, you can see oil is black, uh, coal is gray, and the big stock exchanges are oil dominated. The many smaller stock exchanges, particularly in, in Asia, um, are, are um, coal dominated. And for those of you who, uh, th this, there's nothing proprietary here, you know, we'll post this, uh, you know, you can plagiarize this, take the slides, uh, there's nothing that uh, is a problem in that regard if you want to take notes, not to take notes. Uh, and then you put on the capex for potential reserves, you see what's coming. Um, it's, it, it's kind of crazy. So 80% of this is at risk of being impaired or stranded, and nobody at any point in the financial sector is recognizing that. So um, how balanced are the capital flows? The things we have to look at here, you will know how this works, I'm not gonna go through it, but um, the two figures that are really important are the capex going into the development of the reserves, that $674 billion last year, and the dividends going back to the investors, 126 billion. Now, if you think as an investor, you think, crikey, that had better be a good investment. All that stuff they're putting in CapEx is my money. And if there's a risk that they're putting it into stuff that may end up stranded, ooh, I don't know that I like the sound of that. So these are the two um, issues. A $6 trillion punt over the next 10 years, that's how we cast it, that's what they're doing. You know, all Professor Kemp yesterday talking about all that money he needs in the North Sea. Um, that's part of a $6 trillion punt that these assets will get used. Uh, and what about the investors? You know, these people who have hitherto stood behind the system full square. How about this? This is the oil and gas analyst at HSBC. Business as usual is not a viable option. Management should be looking at other business models that reduce the re risk of stranded assets. This is one of the top oil and gas industry analysts in the capital markets. Uh, destroying shareholder value in future, capital allocation should emphasize shareholder returns rather than investing for growth. How about that? Imagine if all the oil and gas analysts start saying that. This is possibly a winner in terms of the argumentation that we have for dealing with climate change and um, re-diverting capital to survival, not insanity. So we, we see it as push or jump. Who's going to crack first? We're talking to the Bank of England. We've got another meeting with the Bank of England coming up in a couple of weeks. 
We've had one already. The regulator could require that this risk is recognized. Um, and then uh, others right across the financial chain, be they actuaries, be they asset owners, be they accountancy houses, all the props of the financial chain, they could jump before they're pushed. And if one of them jumps, then all the others are going to jump because that's how the capital markets work, just to cover their backsides. And then we have a really interesting risk debate out there, which is going to make it more and more difficult to capitalize tar sands and all the rest of it. Let's talk a little bit about peak oil, because that's terribly relevant to future electricity. Military views, um, uh, I think everyone here is aware of what military bodies have said and do say about the risk of, of oil depletion. Um, and you know, when you think about it, if you look at the US military in uh, the Middle East, 22 gallons per person per day, and 10% or thereabouts of all the casualties were on oil and water convoys. No wonder they're interested in this issue. Um, and of course, the military has, in the US at any rate, has quite impressive renewable energy programs as a naval exercise with biofuels off Hawaii there. And they recognize as well the psychology going on here, the famous Bundeswehr report on peak oil risk last year. Psychological barriers cause indisputable facts to be blank out and lead to almost instinctively refusing to look into this subject in detail. Peak oil, however, is unavoidable. Um, there's an industry view here. It's not like the run-up to the financial crisis. There's a group of us who are very worried. Um, I think everyone here will have seen our um, industry task force report, Virgin, Scottish and Southern, Stagecoach, Arup, um, my own company and others. Don't let the credit crunch catch us out in the way, the oil crunch catch us out, catch us out in the way that the credit crunch did. Now, this was in 2010. Many of you will be thinking, oh, but we've had the shale gas and shale oil um, explosion of understanding since then. Let's look at what the IEA has to say about that in just a minute. This was our view. We think um, that by 2015 at the latest, uh, unlike what we heard from Peter Jackson, um, there will actually be a dissent and it will, it will come as a surprise. Um, much of this has to do, as we argue in, in our report and others have subsequently spelt out, with demand worries. And you see the infrastructure programs in the Middle East. Uh, this is two views of the same shot, um, some years separate in Dubai. You can see the small um, towers in the top diagram kind of lost in the infrastructure that's been built in the interim. And the famous diagram from um, the Royal Institute for International Affairs that shows consumption going up in Saudi Arabia on current trends, burning, electric, uh, burning oil and electric power plants that shows exports going down, even assuming that production can be held at projected levels, which many of us doubt. Um, and what happens somewhere between 2025 and 2030, there is no oil left to export. Now, here's the interesting thing, and forgive me, many people wouldn't know this. How do the, the Saudis know they have a problem here? How do they, um, and they're quite open about it, how do they intend to deal with it? What do they say? Do they say what we were told they would have said a few years ago, that there's tons of oil, we can open up any old oil field any time we like, and that's what we're going to do? No, they don't say that. They say they're going to do, deal with it using new energy, and they mean nuclear, good luck to them on that front, and solar. That's what they say. And that gentleman there, Prince um, Turkey, said in a speech the other day that he hopes the kingdom will be 100% alternative-powered within his lifetime. He's 65%. Of course, he did use the H word, hope, <laughs> but that's what he said. Um, and so this is all very interesting. And it brings the IEA in, and I probably don't have time to go through this I'll, in detail. I'll leave um, you to sort of read the extracts. If you had to pull the essence out of the world energy outlooks every year, you can see the, the racking up of concern about oil supply uh, through to the famous report in 20. 2008, we face an oil crisis. Supply growth isn't catching up with demand, said the then um, executive director. 2008, little or no mention of shale gas or tight, tight oil at this time. Of course, reluctance to even use the term peak oil, but um, an oil crisis. And then uh, the famous diagram which Shell Alec Lett has dissected with his team of bright young things at Uppsala. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm sure everyone in this room knows about it. If you don't, I refer you to the Uppsala work. But, you know, the IEA's view in 2008 that uh, you know, crude has already peaked. 
It's going to go down steeply. Shell and his team think even steeper. Uh, and where's the rest going to come from? All those pastel shades. And we've all watched the, um, the we've all watched the, the executives of the IEA give these talks. We've all studied their body language. Very clear, they don't believe there's a snowball's chance in hell of that happening. Uh, and so in 2009, we begin to see shale gas coming in as a game changer. Uh, by 2010, there's talk about the golden age of gas. And then we go through to 2012, where we have this view that actually all of a sudden, we're heading for Saudi America. I mean, what is going on here? What is the quality of this advice that we're being given? And um, Maria van der Hoven's FT op-ed just the other day in the, uh, uh, arguing that unless US pipelines are built, the boom is going to turn to, bu to bust. And here again, uh, just to flag some of the fantastic work that we see recurrently on the oil drum that virtually never makes it out into the mainstream press. This is the US crude oil um, production revolution. As we heard from Ken yesterday, it's about two million barrels. Um, and then you look at Owen Means and his team of what, what they've done in talking about the, the data on drilling rigs. And here you see in that um, chart of Ewan's the, the gas rigs dropping off as they realize the low price is a huge problem. They turn to tight oil and you see the oil rigs going up. And, you know, how many people out there, how many energy correspondents in newspapers appreciate that to get that two million barrels, they've had to use more than 50% of the world's non-FSU, non-China drilling rigs in North Dakota and elsewhere in these three places. And how sustainable is that? Uh, and again, we heard from, from Ken about, you know, um, the, the drop-off in the wells yesterday. So the shale surprise is, I think, too, the risk of a shale surprise is twofold. There's a whiff of Ponzi in, in all this. These gas companies are losing money hand over fist. The gas boom is not working for them. It's working for the banks, uh, and it's working for the service companies. It's not working for the gas companies. As Art says, you know, many of them are heading for the rocks. And here does just about, this argument does get into the mainstream press, Article in the New York Times, you know, sounding an alarm about the gas rush. Article in the Financial Times saying familiar echoes in this boom. And that's familiar echoes with the boom in housing, in subprime mortgages and the rest of it. And then, of course, that lady, Deborah Rogers, if you don't know her report, she's an investment banker who studied all this. And her view is, I don't know if it's true, but this, this is her view, that the whole thing is a Wall Street scam that they have deliberately orchestrated the low price in cash so they can have an orgy of M&A and feed on the bonuses. Now, you sort of say that's a bit of an outlandish um, accusation, isn't it? Until you ask yourself the question, is Wall Street capable of outlandish scams of this kind? <laughs> and then, even if it's not uh, a Ponzi scheme, then um, what about the exportability of it? And here you see the density of wells in one shale gas field in the United States, the incremental emergence of evidence of, of, of uh, environmental problems. And you think, you know, is this really going to work in Surrey or these places? And this is just delicious. These are adjacent days, uh, the Wall Street Journal, global gas push stalls, and all the reasons that Ron Oxburgh talked yesterday um, and more. You know, the availability of water in China is a big problem. Uh, evidently, the shale quality in Poland, on and on and on. And the very next day in the Financial Times, Chancellor backs gas to fire up Britain. Nice one, George. Finally then, uh, some thoughts on the future electricity system in the light of this uh, shakeout. We need to begin with the end in mind. Um, we need to think about mobilization right, rates and then prospects. We all know that we have the kit to get to that artist's impression view of the future. We can all debate you know, what it looks like, but it's a zero carbon or low carbon uh, future, and that's off-the-shelf kit. 
uh, never mind the stuff that's coming if we, if we do the kind of thing we know that we can do. So we should be bullish about this in the insurgency, and you know many of us are. So the IPCC's special report says it's perfectly feasible to get to 80% modern economy, uh, global economy, 80% power by 2050. Now that's the lowest common denominator view. There are many people in that, in the hundreds of authors there who dragged that down from the 100% that many of us believe in. The German Environment Ministry, Deutsche Bahn, have targets and timetables, if you'll forgive the pun, for running the entire German railway system 100% on renewables. So don't let them tell you we can't run a modern economy on modern renewables. Uh, a variety of players in the combi craftwork experiment, modelers at Stanford and Berkeley, and, and this is one of my favorite ones if you don't know it, Scientific American in 2009. The Stanford Berkeley team, how do we get to an 11 terawatt world? Plenty of available locations um, away from cities and areas of beauty and all that sort of thing. Um, and they plotted it out in one scenario, not using biomass biofuels, but you know, right down to the number of power plants that you need in each category. It's just one scenario. The mix may be different from this. But the critical thing here is that we could renewably power a modern global economy by 2030 with this mix of technologies not mobilizing any technology any faster than we have already mobilized technologies historically. So, you know, we, we can and we should be bullish. And this is, um, you know, a, a day in California using this kind of approach, mixing and matching the different types. Uh, I would, was going to talk about Germany here, but there's a great poster upstairs. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the gentleman or person who did it, but I recommend you have a look at that and the role of, of solar in, um, in the mix with wind. Wind is not our en enemy, wind is our natural partner. Here from the IPCC's um, special report on renewables, you see the mobilization rates, you know, fast, not fast enough. Uh, solar PV in yellow, particularly fast and some of the stats from the Global Status Report just um, out a couple of days ago. Modern renewable, this is not the traditional biomass, modern renewables are nearly up in double figures, 9.7% um, in 2012. Our share of um, electricity uh, generation is 21.7%, and that's you know, growing despite all the problems on 2011. In the European Union now, last year, 70% of the additions were renewable. So, you know, we're coming from behind, but um, we can get there. And as for um, annual generation additions, uh, more than half renewables, um, uh, that's more than fossil fuel and nuclear combined. Not surprising, increasingly, to the analysts who get their money, so much of their money from the big energy incumbency, McKinsey's famous 2012 paper, a thousand gigawatts of economic solar PV potential by 2020, and this will change the face of the uh, global energy industry. That's McKinsey, not the solar industry telling you this. Um, what are we dealing with in terms of uh, the uh, incumbency and their mobilization rates? Um, I talked to Ron <clears throat> after his presentation yesterday about CCS, but Carbon Tracker actually looked at what you could do if you mobilize CCS as fast as the IA wants to, and you can take a bit of a bite out of the problem, 125 gigatons of carbon dioxide, um, but you know it's, it's not going to make that much difference. And in order to do that, you would have to have 3,000 800 CCS projects by 2050. There are eight in the world at the moment. There are eight in planning. So this has a mobilization problem. Nuclear, um, Okelioto and Flamanville there, and we're going to hear about this in a minute. I'm uh, intrigued to um, hear how uh, the next speakers are going to explain this, which is the rise of the cost at Flamanville and uh, the delay, and of course, similar uh, story in Old Cold Yoto. So over the last three years, my company has brought down the price at which we can offer domestic solar PV to give retail electricity by 60%. And in those three years, the, the cost of Flammerville has gone up by 70%. And then there's Fukushima. You, you know, there were three meltdowns there. That brings the total 
to 12 since 1957. That's an average of one every three years, as NRDC have pointed out. So, you know, it's going to happen again. And can this industry survive uh, yet another disaster of this kind? Meanwhile, in Germany, you know, national experience is showing that the alternative is doable. They've done it at scale in the, uh, in the combi craft work experiment in 2006. Um, I don't have time to go into this. But if you uh, look at the reference, you'll see what can be done. And the real experience, this is Barnum and others from the Fraunhofer and Imperial College. You see the gap between um, the, the actual price, the solar price, for, uh, and, and the base load going down, the annual cycle going down as more solar comes in, creating a, um, a, a midday peak in the way that the that the excellent poster upstairs uh, shows. So lots to be encouraged about. We know how fast we can go. This is a solar roof on the left there that Solar Century put up in 10 weeks from commissioning of the project to commissioning of connection to the grid, 10 weeks. This is low, um, in low carbon housing that we did with Scottish and Southern. Um, for some of their workers. All the electricity coming from our solar roof tiles on the roof there. In passing, all the heating in this development coming from any one of four renewable energy technologies on site and plenty of electricity left over to charge the car. Energy efficiency, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, skip a few slides here. Mustn't forget development, that vast area of the world that is literally dark, that has the best insulation. How crazy is that, especially when you think um, how quickly solar lighting can be disseminated into these markets as um, Sunny Money, the retail brand of my charity SolarAid, is showing. Mobilization rates of capital, despite all our problems, the worst recession in 100 years, you see how it's rising. There's now more than a quarter of a trillion dollars going in for each of the last three years. That's it for three years running more capital than has been going into fossil fuel investments. As that capital flows in, so the scale goes up, the costs come down. Um, it's not a problem, it's not a story without problems, but it is a very encouraging story that we can build on. 60% uh, decrease in average price uh, as a result of the German feed-in tariff in residential PV uh, since 2006. But, this is the very latest Bloomberg investment data, you see what's happening in 2012. Um, the figures are going down. So I would argue that, you know, finally this desperate push, this defense by the incumbency is beginning to um, pay off for them in uh, withdrawal of support. Issues, big issues, of course. I don't have time to talk about them. I was going to talk about energy return on investment. I don't have time to do that. And then finally, just to conclude the prospects, you know, um, if you've seen the film or read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. You can imagine how we get to this scenario from where we are today. Um, if you haven't read the book and haven't seen the film, don't. It's too depressing. Um, and we're leaderless, you know? We are essentially leaderless. Uh, you could argue that what President Obama said yesterday about climate change, he was allowed to do by what the markets are doing anyway. So that's following, it's not leading. Um, and so, just in conclusion, and like all aging men with uh, B in my bonnet, I have a book coming out, uh, and this is what it's called, and I, I, I do think that there is an alternative, a counter scenario in, in which the future electricity system will be very important. Um, uh, but if we get to it, there'll be five premises for it, and let me quickly go through them. The power of context, I think it's going to be driven by crisis. We don't do this by policy. We react to crisis. And our leaders, you know, did. In the financial crisis, it could have been worse. There could have been a complete meltdown of the global financial system. So when the next crisis comes, there will be a narrow window of opportunity to do something about it. The readiness of clean energy to grow explosively at that time, the, these kinds of developments can be built very quickly. We can synergize with gas. This is CHP, solar, uh, and other renewables in Woking. Um, deployed very quickly with the right combination of circumstances there. We have 50 families of clean tech 
that are ready to go of different types and they embrace transport as well. Then um, if we can tap this pro-social empathic tendency in the human mind, uh, Jeremy Rifkin has a wonderful book about this uh, and a theory of how we're seeing with the proliferation of communication channels an increasing step function of empathy and ability to interrelate to far off populations, the Arab Spring, the rise of Avars and things like this. The increasing evidence of people power anyway, um, the way that brands can turn toxic and immediately see destruction of brand value, um, that hopefully will continue. And then finally, the intrinsic pro-social nature of, of clean energy. Those of us who work in this stuff see it every day, time and time again, just how it works in a virtuous circle to uh, do social good beyond the capturing of emissions. And after all, so much of what's coming is going to be about jobs, repairing society with job creation, and what sort of jobs do we want? Coal mining underground or um, the, the alternative? So to conclude, I think um, our future electricity system will emerge in the context of ruinous shocks. It can involve renaissance, but this isn't guaranteed. The incumbency, bewilderingly, is fighting hard, and it will fight harder yet. The pattern of play offers hope to the insurgency, not guarantee of success, but hope, as I hope I've uh, illustrated. The neuroscience offers some hope um, in uh, respect of empathic thinking for the insurgency. And make no mistake, this is not an overstatement. The fate of civilization hangs in the balance. Thank you very much for listening to me.